Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman went on a tour of Mideast capitals late last month, renewing his contracts with leaders of Egypt, Jordan and Turkey. MBS, as he's known, was a favorite of the Trump administration, but was subsequently shunned by the Biden team, which frequently waves the flag of human rights for domestic considerations as a pillar of the administration's foreign policy, so long as it conforms, of course, with Washington's strategic interests. Hence, in light of global shifts which altered strategic considerations, Biden is forced to bring MBS back in from the cold ahead of a regional Arab summit the House of Saudi is scheduled to hold when it hosts President Joe Biden later this month. To analyze the latest developments related to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we're joined all the way from New Jersey in the United States by Dr. Joshua Kresna, who is a lecturer on intelligence and Middle East security at NYU and a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Thank you for joining us, sir. Also joining us from Athens, Greece, is Professor Ephraim Ba, who is the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. My pleasure. Indeed, and with us here in the studio is our TV7 editor at large, host of TV7 Watchmen Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding on the state of play regarding the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia obviously has a central role in the region because it is, one may say, a petrodollar power. But militarily, it is very weak. At one time, uh, in the late 1970s, uh, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown, when uh, briefing President Carter, called it a military zero. Now, it is no longer a zero. Uh, some value uh, must be given its armed forces, but nevertheless, it needs protection. The kingdom cannot uh, uh, defend itself without outside support uh, in intelligence, in uh, um, uh, some uh, surface-to-air uh, defense. And we have seen reports of the Israeli chief of staff, uh, Lieutenant General Kohavi, meeting with his Saudi counterpart at Sharm el-Sheikh, obviously with uh, American and Egyptian uh, presence. And there were other reports. The question is, when Biden comes over, is it the culmination of some subterranean subsurface streams, shifts, uh, which have been uh, going on for some quite time, and now we'll, uh, we will see an overt indication of them? Or will he generate a new wave of uh, reforms, uh, normalization efforts, and the like? It seems as if the, the former rather than the latter is uh, more correct. Uh, regional actors, have been growing close with some American cooperation, especially since Israel was uh, moved from UCOM to CENTCOM under the unified command plan of the um, uh, US Def Defense Department. And perhaps Biden, even though he's uh, politically weak back at home, can contribute uh, something. But most of what we are going to see in a couple of weeks has already happened and is now all only being exposed. Uh, the Biden administration may be see, uh, seemed as uh, weak, but of course the United States is regarded as strong uh, nonetheless. When we're talking about the construct and uh, of regional developments and Saudi Arabia playing a key role in this, uh, Dr. Krasna, how is this affecting the various developments at play? As, uh, as Amir pointed out, um, Mohammed bin Salman uh, in the past few weeks has done a victory lap, right? He went to he he he, um, he was in, he met with the uh, Israeli foreign minister. Um, sorry, he uh, traveled uh, uh, to Turkey. He traveled to Jordan. Um, he traveled to Egypt, and uh, now he's having uh, uh, Biden is uh, apparently uh, coming to visit him. And in that context, as you said, he's going to be doing a regional. Um, uh, um, uh, forum and of course this is uh, this is a function of uh, of at least two different uh, issues. Part of uh, part of his regional tour has to do with the United States in a negative sense. Um, all of the regional powers are feeling that the United States is um, or or already aware. It didn't start now. It didn't even start under Biden. 
The United States is trying to uh, reassess and reconfigure its involvement in the region, which leaves uh, more of the burden sharing on the uh, shoulders of the regional players. And those regional players are now arranging themselves. And that really helps us explain a lot of the other things that are going on in the region that aren't necessarily connected to the American, but for instance, uh, uh, compared to um, a regional uh, cooperation between Israel and most of the Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, which tends to be a little bit uh, uh, more discreet uh, at this moment. And of course, it also is a function of an international development of, uh, uh, of the um, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and of the uh, um, effect that that had on the energy market. And then it turns into a domestic American issue. Because if, by, if the uh, Democrats um, uh, lose big in the, uh, in the uh, midterm elections, and by the way, I'm not sure they will as of this week's developments, it's going to be because the price of gas went up. And the price of gas is directly related to the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And one of the people who's perceived as having the key to that is, is uh, 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 Mohammed bin Salman. So, so um, um, Saudi Arabia has sort of been pushed into the cockpit of these regional and international developments. And that's, uh, and, and that's very significant. And by the way, didn't change a whole lot of the problematical issues that were theoretical or problematical about their policy until now. And the, the rest of the world has shifted. Uh, uh, Bukhan bin Salman hasn't really shifted a lot. And that's why I quote a victory lap, because in the end, um, he is uh, yet again um, sort of a, a key interlocutor um, in the Middle East. Um, uh, you just uh, you see some of the pictures of Erdogan, Erdogan's face when he met with him in, in, in Ankara, and you understand that um, that uh, that relationship, for instance, is not because the Turkey, uh, Turks uh, particularly wanted it, uh, uh, but rather because they don't really have a choice in their whole uh, regional retrenchment. So I think um, um, that's sort of the, uh, the, the broader uh, uh, strategic context in which this is all occurring. Uh, Professor Inbal, I'd like to hear your take on this, but I'd like also to point out you're currently in, in Athens, Greece. Uh, attending with the Hellenic Forum, which uh, deliberates various developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and you are, uh, of course, Greece is also constituting one of the closest allies of Saudi Arabia and the continental Europe uh, with uh, deep connections, also renewed investments as of late uh, with uh, deliberations on connecting a uh, data uh, sub C. Uh, uh, cable that would then also connect Saudi Arabia through Naom and, and other areas uh, much closer to, to Europe. Is there some connection within the interests in, in uh, the broader Eastern Mediterranean region to the inclusion of Saudi Arabia and potentially also the deepening of connections uh, between Israel and uh, the Arabian Kingdom, even though it's not being conducted uh, in an uh, overt capacity? Well, I think that what is common among uh, uh, East Mediterranean countries is disappointment with the Biden administration. Uh, one of the issues that brings those countries together, Egypt, uh, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, is of course the energy issue. And uh, President Biden canceled uh, his support for uh, the East Med pipeline that was supposed to bring gas from Eastern Mediterranean uh, to, to Europe, uh, just, I believe, two weeks before the war erupted in Ukraine, which, uh, because of green reasons, uh, which shows, you know, some of the short-sightedness, you know, strategic sightedness of, of this uh, administration. And uh, those countries, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia is to some, of course, connected to the energy issue, uh, are uh, trying to uh, to coordinate their policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, particularly uh, at a time when the uh, United States is perceived as uh, leaving uh, the East Mediterranean, as a real policy in Libya, and also the, the Middle East. And uh, what, what happened, in my view, is that to some extent, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, and the difficulties uh, reaching an agreement with uh, Iran on the nuclear issue uh, has, uh, to some extent, derailed uh, the American strategy of pivoting to China. Suddenly, uh, many other issues uh, appear uh, that uh, do not allow uh, the Americans to concentrate why 
what they think it's the most important issue, uh, China. And uh, Biden has to come to Canossa, to, uh, to Riyadh, basically after, uh, as it was pointed out, uh, uh, criticizing MBS for uh, human rights uh, issues. Uh, but, you know, facts of life uh, are more important than uh, human rights. Uh, and uh, he, he's coming to the Middle East uh, in order to make good with MBS, in order to produce more oil uh, to put on the energy market. Of course, uh, uh, you know, soaring you prices know, in, are an issue. In, in, in American law, there is this um, uh, variety of the dirty dozen, uh, the sort of World War II uh, movie where um, convicted criminals, some of them for murder, are being recruited for a very dangerous mission because if you need them strategically, operationally, tactically, you do that. And the Americans, of course, also dealt with gangsters like Lucky Luciano uh, in, the war, in the war because against the Nazis, it was important to do that. Now, uh, MBS was not a dirty dozen member, but he could be seen as the pariah prince. And um, President Biden was his uh, parole officer while MBS was on probation. So apparently now he's off probation. He's back in uh, uh, good company because he is needed. And Biden is no bleeding heart left-leaning liberal. He is a cold warrior, a former cold warrior in the tradition of Truman, Kennedy, and Johnson. And he knows that pragmatically, when he needs someone like MBS, even though some in his electoral base in the Democratic Party, the progressive wing, quote unquote, uh, do not like it. Nevertheless, he is going to do or a man's got to do what a man's got to do, a president's got to do what a president's got to do. Dr. Krasman, your take? So um, I would agree with almost everything uh, that Ephraim said, but I want to put the time frame a little bit wider. Um, this doesn't have to do, it has to do partially with the Biden administration, but um, the things that he was discussing, certainly Eastern Mediterranean energy, that precedes the Biden administration. Um, the... Uh, Last year and this year is the first time in many years that there are more U.S. troops in Asia than there are in the Middle East. Um, and that's because um, the pulling out of troops in the Middle East started under Obama, continued under Trump, and, and ended in Afghanistan um, under Biden. And remember that the organization of the Eastern Mediterranean states in a gas, or, uh, in a gas orientation um, had to do with their perception already in the Trump administration that the United, Trump said it, that the United States is reorienting. And they need, yes, it's, it's certainly uh, derailed the pivot to Asia, but the pivot to Asia is still going on. Um, I think that, um, that um, yeah, things that you say during a, a political campaign, like when you say that, uh, that um, uh, uh, Bin Salman's going to be a pariah and that he shouldn't be the next king, right? Those are the things that, um, uh, there's the old saying, right? Uh, uh, where you stand, where you, uh, stand depends on where you sit, right? Once you're, you can say certain things as a candidate that it's more difficult to say uh, once you have to, uh, have to, um, um, uh, once you have to make uh, um, these decisions. But I think in general, this reorientation of the Middle East towards a greater role for the regional players and sort of a, a, a important role for the United States, but understanding that the United States is not going to be the external hegemon among whom the uh, security architecture, uh, around who the security ar architecture is is uh, going to be based, that that's uh, an understanding that even in Israel and, and certainly in the other countries has already been in existence, I would say, for um, at least the past seven or eight years. Uh, I'd like to hear also Professor Lindbell's uh, response to that, but also beyond that, uh, when we're looking at uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, it seems like under the Biden administration with uh, a national security advisor who is an expert, uh, Mr. Sullivan, of course, uh, on uh, China and with a CIA director who is an expert on uh, specifically Russia, uh, Secretary of State, of course, uh, defines himself an expert on human rights. Uh, there is a uh, lack of understanding on Middle East culture, and it, it seems like it's a, a resurfaced uh, issue time and again 
uh, in which there is a disconnect between uh, the traditional conservative understandings on regional scales within the Middle East and elsewhere uh, to that of the United States, which uh, demands countries to align themselves with Washington's principles and values. Is this something that continues to play a, a challenging disconnect between Washington and Riyadh at this point? It's quite clear that uh, with the Americans announcing that they are less interested in, in the Middle East, the Middle Eastern actors have greater freedom of action and actually they exercise. And we see the Negev uh, uh, summit and uh, last week in, uh, in Bahrain that uh, the uh, director generals of the foreign ministries came together to try to uh, Build uh, some kind of defensive policy against uh, against Iran under and, U.S. patronage, uh, like, however. What I would like again, uh, which was also done with a U.S. representative there and under U.S. patronage. Yes. Of course, uh, Americans are there, and you know they want to get out of the Middle East, but it's not so easy to get out. You know, the, it's like the Trotsky question about the war. You may not what uh, you may not be interested in war, but the war is interested in you. And the Middle East, as it is, uh, attracts, you know, it's, it's, it's still an important region that you cannot really uh, disconnect. I would like, however, to point out that Saudi of today is not Saudi Arabia of 20 years ago. It's actually uh, a weaker country. Uh, we see that uh, Saudis tried uh, to dismantle the Assad regime. They were not successful. Uh, we see they wanted to isolate Qatar for not obeying, you know, Saudi uh, rules. They were not successful. Uh, actually, the Emirates and the Bahrainis uh, took the initiative to diverge from uh, uh, the Saudi line and uh, had open and decided to have open relations to the Israel. Uh, the Saudis may be next. I don't know when. Uh, I'm not sure they'll come out of the closet uh, soon, but uh, the Saudis have difficulties in Houthis in Yemen. Uh, it's definitely not a military power. Uh, and uh, this reflects on its status in the region as well vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Indeed. Mr. Olin, I'd like to hear your take on this, uh, of course. Uh, but... Uh, Beyond that, we saw also the meeting last week between uh, Prime Minister of Iraq, al Qadimi, and, and uh, the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, during which they discussed, uh, at least according to uh, the Iraqis, uh, the dialogue be being held behind closed doors or an attempt to restart uh, over dialogue uh, between the Iranians and the Saudis. The Saudis obviously have mutual concerns with Israel in this matter and uh, have uh, failed, as Professor Inbao uh, accurately mentioned, uh, to withstand uh, the, uh, the Houthi rebels or the Houthi militia, which is the Iranian-backed militias, basically the Iranians in Yemen, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, the only reason for the current ceasefire uh, upheld in Yemen is actually the militias that are loyal to the United Arab Emirates uh, from uh, all. So along the lines of um, no uh, permanent alliances, only permanent interests, uh, there was a time when um, Iran under the Shah was uh, the guarantor of Gulf security, including Saudi Arabia, perhaps mostly Saudi Arabia, because the House of Saud was so weak in the 1970s, and there was the uh, great uh, raid on, on the Grand Mosque in Mecca and all of that. And right now, uh, what um, has changed um, over the last 20 years or so is that the Palestinian factor is not as important. There was a time, a long time, when, in addition to the uh, Saudi monarchs uh, claiming that uh, uh, they uh, uh, should have priority in the question of Jerusalem, uh, which was one of the reasons um, the Saudis bankrolled the Yom Kippur War 
for Sadat and Assad. Without the Saudis and the oil weapon, there probably would not have been a 1973 war. But in addition to, do it, to that, the Palestinian terrorist organizations extorted from the Saudis not only money, but also policies. This has changed because the Palestinians uh, have uh, absolutely uh, less power than they used to. And relatively, the Iranians are much more threatening. And therefore, the Saudis uh, have reconsidered. And because they want to keep their control over the kingdom, uh, this is not a democracy by far. Um, they want uh, to share the wealth between the 5,000 princes and no more. Um, Israel, with its uh, uh, fantastic intelligence capability, can help them get advance warning regarding both external and internal threats. So it's very important to them, not only because of Iron Dome or such technology. It's very important for them that Israel sees its interest in having the House of Saud keep its rule in Riyadh and Jeddah and the other places. Indeed. Well, uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program. We have about five minutes left, and I'd like to get a sense of uh, where things are leading to it, uh, within uh, the context of everything that we've been speaking about. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, you, Dr. Kostner, to what degree is uh, the House of Saud or particularly the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, relevant today within the, the um, uh, security architecture of the region, uh, considering the fact that it is uh, lacking many capabilities, which the United States under the Trump administration promised to deliver. So um, I'll do it as, as short as I can. Israel tends to be, uh, a, as, as very often, um, Iran obsessed. I understand that why. And I understand why a lot of the reporting about the recent cooperation has had to do with Iran. But we have to remember that in this regional constellation that's being built, most of the Arab parties, Iran is not their major concern. And in fact, or is their major concern, but they don't agree uh, or feel that they have the power to do the kind of things we'd like to do. Both the UAE and Saudi Arabia are engaged with Iran. UAE, by the way, denied the Wall Street Journal report that they are involved in cooperation, even though it's pretty clear that they are. Um, for Egypt and Jordan, it's not a it's not a, a first uh, criteria uh, either. However, Saudi Arabia is a very, very important player. First of all, in this region, that is the region that's between Iran and Egypt, it's the largest state. Second of all, it's the rich state. And all of these other states that are dependent, apart from the UAE, um, all of the other Arab states are dependent to it on uh, for some level or other for uh, for financial support. So therefore, um, the Saudis are playing a very significant role. And uh, in addition, of course, since Iraq is, is uh, extremely weak, uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE are the de facto leaders right now of, uh, of the eastern part of the Arab world, and they have disagreements with them, right? I think UAE is, is um, farther forward on a lot of issues, both re regarding both relations with Israel, but also relations with Iran, um, uh, than Saudi Arabia. So um, I think Saudi Arabia is a very important player. I think we tend to see it as a very, very important player because it's uh, the holy grail for our um, new uh, stage of normalization. And of course, the significance of them being the lowest pro uh, the lowest cost producer of oil in the world and the, lar the country with the largest uh, potential reserves gives them at this moment when the oil prices are high because of the, of the Russian invasion of, of um, Ukraine, gives them a very unique role in the region and, and uh, internationally. That specific role will continue, but I'm not sure that um, that as the markets begin to adjust and as uh, uh, replacement um, sources begin to come in, I'm not sure that they will keep that time to the extent that it is right now. Indeed. Professor Inbao? I think uh, Saudi Arabia is also important because it hosts Mecca, the center of uh, the Muslim world, a holy place, the holiest place. And uh, therefore, uh, it confers upon Saudi Arabia a certain aura of authority, which other uh, Muslim states do not have. For Israel, of course, it's very important because uh, relations with Israel, if it will happen, will be the ultimate legitimacy of making, of having Israel a, a normal state in the region. And hopefully uh, what has begun 
as uh, much uh, business uh, under the table. And as one of my friends uh, uh, says, uh, once it was very crowded under the table, now it's more above the table. Uh, so if this will uh, continue, uh, I'm not sure that uh, Saudis will go out into the open, but this is very important uh, for uh, normalizing the existence of, of Israel in the region. So building on uh, what Professor Inbad just said, let me uh, hazard the speculation. Biden has both uh, minimal and maximal um, expectations regarding this particular aspect. Um, at the maximum, an Israeli official, a foreign minister, or even a prime minister will virtually appear on some video conference when the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and Biden and other leaders uh, are convening in Riyadh. Uh, at the minimum, the fifth fleet, along with an Israeli naval officer and a Saudi naval officer, will have some common endeavor. Well, at least in the Kingdom of Bahrain, but uh, indeed, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Dr. Krasna, Professor Inbar, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's panel, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.